Welcome to the Hunter's Advantage Podcast, where a group of budget-minded hunters scour the woods for whitetail bucks and whatever other big game is in season. Tune in each week to hear the hilarious public and private land hunting stories and mistake-filled lessons learned. We believe that every hunt brings us closer to God and that we exist to share the good news. And now, your hosts, Christian Babcock and Jake Gaylord. Listen, guys, we wouldn't be able to do the podcast if it wasn't for you all. So we just want to say that you guys are greatly appreciated, and thank you for following along each week. And speaking of support, we are partnered with Out on a Limb Manufacturing, and I can tell you from firsthand experience, Matt and Chase are great down-to-earth guys, and they make some of the best saddle hunting products out there. Whether you're looking for a set of climbing sticks or a mobile, lightweight, hang-on tree stand, or maybe you're even a one-sticker, you mean tree pilates yes tree pilates if you've been to the grocery store or the gas station lately you know that uncle joe is doing his absolute worst to take all your money that's why we need hunting gear that lasts year after year and trust me i've been rocking the same out on a limb shikar climbing sticks for four years and the ridge runner 2.0 saddle hunting platform for a few years as well this gear is built to last we can confidently say that out on a limb is the best bang for your buck and it's the best gear if you want to deflate a big old buck make sure you use code hnta15 at outonalimmfg.com for 15 percent off anything on their website so if you can show them the same support that you guys show us please go to outonalimmfg.com and use code hnta15 for 15 percent off at checkout now let's get back to the podcast Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Hunter's Advantage podcast. Today, we are joined by a special guest, Ethan Kyle. Thanks for jumping on with us, man. We're looking forward to talking to you. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, of course. So if if uh, people have been living under a rock or they just don't get on Facebook or North American Whitetail or anywhere else, they haven't seen your buck. But for people that uh, do tune into everything that's going on in the Whitetail world, you shot a close to 230-inch buck down in South Central Oklahoma. I don't know how you ever mention the location that's pretty bold but uh <laughs> but yeah that's 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 pretty cool that's probably where people wouldn't know you from but um like uh, what we wanted to do to start out the the conversation was obviously uh your big buck slayer i can see that from the buck behind you and the ones up on the wall about 10 foot up there but where we wanted to start was kind of up green upbringing and hunting background have you always been a bow hunter kind of how did you get involved and i know you grew up in oklahoma like us so there's not much else to do but how did you kind of get into all this uh yes uh i i've said this before and i, I tell everybody that i that i talk to about hunting uh, i didn't really have much of a choice i was my parents were lucky enough they purchased my uh lifetime hunting and fishing combo when i was uh six months old so uh, I didn't have any choice in the matter. Uh, I was I was pretty much pushed into it from the time I could walk, and I, I've loved every minute of it. I mean, there's nothing I do I don't do uh, as far as in the outdoors, uh, from fishing, noodling to hunting every season of the year. Uh, I don't I don't discriminate against anything as far as the uh, outdoors go. Not even crossbows or anything like that. Oh my. God. It's what we're doing right, there. right off the bat. Here we go. I'm just messing with you. I'm just messing with you. <laughs> no, yeah, I, uh, I tell my dad, my dad hunts with a crossbow, but he's had a couple of shoulder surgeries, so he gets a pass. But uh, his right. crossbow actually blew up on him uh, preseason last year, and I was like, well, I guess you got to use your uh, the big boy bow now. That's awesome. Because <laughs> he, he, he has a he has a old Matthews he he hunted with before. But I said, yeah, I guess you got to use the big boy bow now. <clears throat> That's funny. no. Uh, I do just want to throw this out there. I am just kidding about all the crossbow stuff. I mean, I know this is our first time meeting, and I'm pretty aggressive on that type of front. But I just want you to know, I don't really care. <laughs> I don't care either. <laughs> okay, good deal. We were but, talking. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to ask, and I, I know we're going to get into that buck here here sooner. But uh, how many messages did you get saying, oh, you definitely shot that from a high up in steer? Because by looking at it immediately, I'm like, oh, that that nine foot, 10 foot fence all day again. Oh, yeah, I'm that was the that was literally like probably the first. I don't know, probably every other comment on every Facebook post about it mm -hmm. was 
uh, either high fenced or got out of high fence. <laughs> and and I, I promise you, I got witnesses and taxidermists to to back me. There's no ear. There's no uh, hole in the ear. So so we're good there. Hey, that's all that matters. No, I mean you, we were talking about being equal opportunists. So what you you kind of a you're a guy that noodles in the summer, shoots turkeys, and you do all that sort of stuff. Yes, I, I enjoy every bit of it. I mean, from predator hunting in the winter time to to turkeys and uh, archery, rifle. Um, I, I got the opportunity to go to Colorado when I was young. Um, we had a lease in Colorado. My parents did, and there were actually a couple of my dad's friends had a lease, and I was walking up there and and uh, walking beside him at, at four or five years old in Colorado. So. Yeah, I don't uh, discriminate against any any type of hunting or any any type of outdoor activities. I'm I'm all about it. Yeah, that's awesome. That reminds me of my uncle Justin. He's like, he's he said I don't discriminate. I'm an equal opportunity hunter. Whatever walks yeah, out in front exactly. of me, it's a pig, a coyote. It doesn't matter if I got a weapon in my hand. It's time. It's go time. I, I, so, if it's a if it's if I'm hunting and a pig walks out, it's it's a it's pig season. Oh, it's do a you, sin not to shoot those things. Do you get quite exactly. a bit where you're at? Oh, man. And all of my my trail cam pictures of this deer, if you notice, there's a there's panels around my feeder. And that's because I've had to put two feeders up in that on that property because the pigs knocked it over and tore it up. So I finally got tired of buying feeders and just bought panels. Do you, do you hunt them with thermals or anything like that? Uh, yes. Uh, I used to – I have recently sold it kind of around here. It, they actually – good re good reason you know the pig population got a big dent put in it and uh I, I traded my thermal off but i did have a did run a thermal for a while and and man that was a blast i know it doesn't put in a dent in them shooting them with a bow but there's no more fun than shooting with i love like we hunt all over we hunt the southern portion of oklahoma all over too and you shoot one and when you hit them in the air you see the freaking dust come off of oh, like yeah. oh that is a nasty yeah. sucker like i mean because we got those nice 4k cameras that we film hunts with and you hit them and it's like a dust cloud Foof! it's awesome Man, it's, it only they, gets about halfway in yeah yeah that's right they uh they're a tough creature i mean there's no no wonder why there's millions of them i mean it's so hard to kill them even with a with a gun or a or a bow much less i mean they don't really have any predators outside of the two or three mountain lions we have in the state allegedly, but we'll, uh, I mean, there's outside of people with thermals, man, there's, there's nothing, nothing putting a dent in that population. No, I'm, so I'm curious. I've, I keep I 35 hot and 69 hot driving. I live in central Texas now, so I'm always okay. driving up and through Oklahoma. Um, oh, yeah. but so I, I, when I think of where you're talking about in Southern central Oklahoma, there's kind of some interesting stuff going on there. You just get over the border a little bit. You got some up and down and some topography and you got out of near the falls Creek church camp. I don't remember what it, where, where is it? Where's that at? What town is that? Uh, Davis, Oklahoma, Davis. That's what it is. It gets yep. real pretty and like kind of waterfalls and up and down. Like, is that similar to the terrain that you're hunting or is it something a little different? Uh, no, I'm actually um, west of Davis a little ways and north northwest of Davis. Um, I have a lot of friends from Davis, matter of fact, and, and I actually have a lease down uh, close to Davis, just a few miles west of there is my other hunting property. But yeah, and it, it changes so fast. Uh, just where I'm at, where this deer came from, it's really just pasture land with a few little bit, few blocks of timber. Um, and then you go 10 miles south, um, and then you're in big rolling hills getting closer to the Arbuckle Mountains. And then my buddy, he has a lease there right by I-35, and he's got elk on his – he's got elk on his uh, lease right oh, there cool. in, the, in the mountains. So, so man, it changes so fast. Just, you know, in 15 minutes, you go from pastures to mountains. Yeah, That's Oklahoma's awesome. a very diverse state. I don't think a lot of – a lot of other people realize just how diverse it is. I mean, maybe they do, but I mean, from Northeast is basically just an extension of Kansas. Right. And then you have your Southeast kind of Kaimichi mountains that run, run in with uh, Arkansas. And then it seems like the whole West sides relatively flat. And especially if you get up there in the panhandle, like Northwest, I mean, 
all you see is yucca bushes. Right. The only thing up there is maybe a few antelope and a Dairy Queen. And the last two times we went through there, at least Boise City, there's been the same dude working that same Dairy Queen for like three years in a row. So God bless his soul. Then hopefully he's manager now. But yeah, yes, Oklahoma's that, Oklahoma's crazy. That's a fact. Uh, my my first couple of deer that I ever got to harvest actually came from Northwest Oklahoma. Uh, we had some family property up there, and and that's where my first three deer came from. And I love hunting up there in that that place where you can you can watch a deer run away for two miles. Yeah. Um, but that, that it's it's a different type of hunt, completely different type of hunting. And, from here and like you said you're just a few hours north i like it out there though i hunt i've hunted near a ceiling to to loga that sort of area and yep. it's cool because you get these big bottoms river bottoms just filled with cedars that are just impenetrable and disgusting and you get a good wheat field or something down there it's like yeah in the right cold 150 yeah. 200 deer on one field and you're like ah dude i've never seen this many deer in my life like <laughs> It's awesome. That's, That's where all the buck sure. venture guys hunt, isn't it? They hunt more they're towards up, Kansas, right? <clears throat> yeah, they're up at La, Laverne, uh, I believe. Yeah. It's, it's uh, mm. uh, out up, uh, by Woodward. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, um, Ethan, so I kind of want to take a step back. I mean, not really rush into this buck just yet, but kind of growing up and maybe even the last couple seasons, what's been your – expectations you know out in the deer woods you know are you hunting for age you hunting for score or are you like me that you know if a hundred incher walks by on the wrong day then it's getting thumped like what's your expectations when you're out there in the woods man i'll tell you i mean my first my my first three deer of my life could have uh could have fit all three of them inside of this deer's rack i mean <laughs> i wasn't i mean even the deer i have on the wall i mean i've had a, the privilege of taking some nice deer but but nothing huge. I mean, that deer, one of those deer behind me, um, actually scored like 145 and was my largest until I killed this deer. Um, so, I mean, I, I haven't, haven't had the opportunity, you know, really to, for one, just to walk, you know, a big deer. I, I, I take that back. I'm sorry. I've missed a big deer, but, <laughs> but nothing <laughs> like this, but yeah, I have, I haven't been really, uh, really picky up until, you know, I got out of high school and, kind of got some some decent property to hunt and, and really started focusing on age I, I if it was a i didn't care about rack you know I, everybody wants to kill a big deer but i mean mature deer that's that's a good enough for me um mm -hmm. but i really really up until probably the past eight years i, I was never picky yeah and again I, I think that's how it should be because okay just the way i view it and if you want to disagree with me feel free 100 percent. like you ain't gonna hurt my feelings whatsoever but uh i think the age at least in today's age kind of gets thrown around too much like too too many people are dependent on age when most people are only hunting you know 20 60 acre chunks and it's like it's hard to manage that especially if you have the wrong neighbors now if you're in like it's all situational right like if you have the right neighbors um and the right management plan like you can hold a really good age class of bucks but i mean as the general public knows i mean most deer don't sport you know most deer sport their biggest rack from ages like five to five to six i believe is what that study shows and mm -hmm. you know in certain places like if you see a three-year-old you're actually doing something so i just feel like a lot of times people need to kind of take that into consideration and not necessarily like hunt for age per se but just what kind of floats their boat at the time does that make sense yeah I, I completely agree, man. I, I, and especially with social media these days and, and it's in all aspects of life. It's not just with deer hunting, but it's fishing. It's, uh, mm -hmm. with when, with women, you know, social media and everything else, you know, comparing yourself to other people and, you know, somebody sees a deer like this and they're like, oh, well, you know, I'm going to hold out forever and pass up every three-year-old deer I see because <laughs> this, be he'll be this hillbilly in central Oklahoma shoots a, a 200 inch deer. So they're out there. So I'm just going to wait forever. And I don't, I don't encourage people to do that. Um, you know, if, like I, we said before, if, if you hold a crossbow, longbow, recurve compound, it doesn't matter whatever you're hunting with. If, if you're happy with a 120 inch deer, shoot it. I mean, like uncle Ted said, I mean, by all means, shoot the spike, you know, 
Mm-hmm. If if that's if that's what you want to do, do it. I, I mean, I, nobody's nobody's gonna get. I don't judge anybody. You know, you I better used not be to, talking crap on the spikes, okay? <laughs> hey man, hey, you should have let me know. I have one too. I could have propped it up. Over here. Yeah. <laughs> my first buck, matter of fact, my first buck with a bow. I was sixteen, and uh, I hadn't really bow hunted up until then, real religiously or anything like that. But uh, I was sitting there in the in the tree stand, and we didn't even run cell cameras on this, or not cell cam. We didn't even run trail cameras. Period on this property, we were just kind of knew there was deer and deer sign, and sitting there one day, and man, this old tree behind me starts shaking, and I start shaking, and out walks this little eight pointer and you can barely call him an eight pointer and man he could have been a one he could have he could have been a 230 like this deer right here it didn't matter i was shaking just as bad then as i was the day i took this deer and you know it it's the feeling it's about the feeling it's not about the size of the animal i mean i get just as jacked up shooting does as i did this deer oh yeah oh with a bow the mystical flight of the arrow oh my gosh dude I, I shot two does in December this year and lit one of them up and she fell in the field. And I was like, that felt like shooting a buck. I, it wasn't a buck, <laughs> but it felt like shooting one. Like it was, yeah. it's, I have about as much fun letting an arrow go as, as you can humanly have. That's, that's legal. I can guarantee you that. Now, if you flip flop it though, you know, and you miss a doe, it's like, darn on to the next one. But if you miss a <laughs> buck, you're like, I, I might get a little bit higher and then jump out head first. <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> oh no it, it's interesting we were talking you guys talking about the you know shooting what you like because i've i've noticed like you talk about people holding off and the social media aspect of it it's it's interesting because um you know the reality is is like a four or five or six year old buck might be 130 or 140 inches in most places i know my lease is in southern oklahoma it's like you see a five six seven year old buck he probably not going to be 150 like it's just that's the reality of it. The most of them aren't. So it's like if that's my measure, then I'm gonna be pretty upset most years. Yeah, that that's exactly right. Uh, matter of fact, my lease down here south of me, uh, that I was saying is closer to the mountains. There's a guy over there, and, and we were talking about that on the lease. There, it's a uh, we have a lease inside of a large cattle ranch. It's eight thousand acres is is the, the total property, and then we have a lease within it. And they like us to shoot. That's the first thing they told me. Shoot whatever you want. It's your money that you paid for. So whatever makes you happy. But we really like to take old deer, you know, and, and that guy was showing me pictures of a, a little buck. I mean, probably, I don't know, maybe 130s, one thirty, maybe 140. But he didn't have a tooth in his head. He was so old. So like you said, I mean, sometimes the genetics just aren't there and, and you're passing up on that deer and he's just going to go freeze to death that winter instead of, you know, you, you could have put an arrow in him and made it a humane death for him or, you know, mother nature's cruel. So it's either going to be by an arrow or a bullet or freeze to death. What's the, so generally speaking, it's really hard to generalize. Like you always say, you never say always and you never say never, but what, like, what is a top end buck for like where you're at? Like, let's say the, like a really good five-year-old, like 150 incher, 160 incher, something like that. Uh, yeah, I, I would say right here around the house. Yeah, without a doubt, 150. I mean, I know people that's hunted their whole life, including my dad, and I mean, he's got some some 150s and uh, maybe a 160, and that's it. And that's a, that's a whole life of hunting around here. That's crazy. So, where did that deer come from then? Two miles. <laughs> Two miles from the house, man. <laughs> I'm telling you, no, where he came from, I don't know. I, I have no idea where where the genetics came from, honestly. Mm-hmm. Um, and everybody's asked me. It's kind of funny. Everybody's like, "Man, you know, you know, where's his kids at? You know, where's his offspring?" They they all. I'm sure you got pictures of them. And I'm like, man, I'm not sure. I, I, the you just know the just, neighbors are going to be keeping tabs on you, so you don't want to <laughs> give out any more any more tidbits, do you? I, Man, I, I'll I'll show you my trail cam. I'll show you my trail cam picks right now. I ain't scared that yeah. there ain't a deer on that property even resembles this deer. Well, those it's so funny people say that. Like, you know, you somebody shoots a giant and then the next year it's like, hey, neighbor wants to lease this place for 20 grand. And it's like those deer 
are such genetic outliers and have to have everything right from nutrition to age to genetics to water to pressure to all of it. I think those are so you just don't see that somebody shooting a 200 inch buck in the next three, four years later, like, Oh, I got another one from his offspring in here. I don't think you ever see that. And another good point to that would be is imagine that buck is a three-year-old. You think someone's going to pass that? Hmm. 160, 170. Do you have a picture of him as a three-year-old? I do. And he's probably a 190 at three. Ooh, (laughs) (laughs) That's hilarious. 190. My point exactly. How many 90 inch, 190 inch three year olds you know of? Hey, I, I do. I, uh, my, well, that a lot of that came out after I, I, I took the deer. Um, I had people showing me trail cam pics, and then a the guy sent me pictures, and he's like, Here he is, here he is at, at three. And I, and I can't, I mean, he doesn't have the drop time or the back one of the back kickers, but you can tell it's him just by everything else. And just the fact, I mean, it's on this, it's two miles or actually three miles. Um, as the crow flies from where I shot him and, and you know, it's him. And, and like, it was in 2021 and he's probably close to 190 there. Now, knowing that, would you, if you knew he was three and you ran into him as a three-year-old, would you have shot him still? Oh, absolutely. Okay, good, good, <laughs> good. Yeah. There, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm telling about you, to end uh, this podcast really quick. <laughs> no, I, I'm telling you though, there. I ain't that picky now. I, I I like shooting old deer, but no, no. I mean, there's there's balances to this. <laughs> oh, absolutely. We had a we had a 150 inch three or, or four year old this year that my buddy Peyton passed three times and it got killed by an outfitter like half a mile from our lease. Yep. We about cried, so I couldn't imagine a 190 mm-hmm. inch three year old. I I just have to. I'd have to. Yeah, and and man, I, I did that <laughs> this year. Um, I actually had a, I had a great year this year. I, I got to harvest this deer on October first, and then in rifle season down on my lease, I got to take one and uh, ended up putting a paper, pen and paper to him, and he ended up grossing about one fifty two. And uh, so it was it was an amazing year for me. And and you know what? It's sad sad to say, and I, I mean I was almost getting to the point you know where I was thinking like, all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna start being picky. You know, I got the one. You know, I'm, I'm only going to shoot this certain deer and all this. And I'm standing at a tailgate behind uh, my friend's dad that's on the lease with me. And uh, we're looking at a deer he killed. Super nice deer. Um, a young deer, but it, it uh, had been shot in the leg in muzzleloader season. And its leg was broke above the knee. So, I mean, he was in bad shape. And uh, he was run down, skinny. And we're looking at him. And he did the right thing by taking the deer. But uh, we're looking at it, and he's like, well, he said, I'll give you some some old man advice. He said, you're going to have to start back over with us common folk now. And so I was like, you know what? I thought about that, and I, and I had a, that, that deer on camera that I was, I'm was i talking about. And the next morning, I was, I'd already made it up. I was walking out there. I said, if he, should, if he walks by, I'm shooting. And it, I just by – pure luck or however you want to put it i'm walking to my stand and i shot him on my way to the stand that morning Jeez. so it was <laughs> it was it was crazy it was a crazy crazy morning but I, I sent that picture to uh my buddy's dad and i said hey i started over this hey i'll start over with a 152 every day <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know that's really starting over i guess that's awesome yeah it's That's, funny. It's funny because Taylor was telling me, yeah, he was, he, we had talked, I talked on him on the phone quite a bit. And he was saying that you shot, you know, you obviously shot your 230 and you shot like a 150s after that. And he said, uh, he said, don't be, he said, don't be sad. Uh, he said, all four of your bucks are about as big as his two. And I was like, that is damn disrespectful. <laughs> but it's probably true. It's probably true. <laughs> That's awesome. So why don't, why don't we, um, why don't we get into the story of this book? Let's let's dive into it then. So let's first start. I guess we can start here. You know, you think of a mega buck like that, and everyone's going to think you have some Drury Outdoors manicured, beautiful property that you've been managing for bucks for a decade. And what that expectation versus the reality, what kind of place are hunting? Were you hunting, and how did the, how did you come about on that spot? Um. Well, I, I was, matter of fact, I was just out cutting hay, um, 
that's kind of what I, I do in the summers and my days off. I, I work shift work, so I have quite a bit of time off. And so I was just out cutting hay and on this property and I see a lot of timber or not a lot of time. I'm sorry. I see a block of timber and I thought, you know, I was just being nosy and got out of the tractor after I got finished and went walking around in there. And I was like, man, there's a lot of sign. I see some old rubs and stuff like that. And I was like, okay. I mean, there was one little clearing. This block of timber is probably 20 acres. And there's a little clearing right in the middle. There's a pond in there. So you got, you got brush, a pond, and a clearing. And I'm like, man, I, it's kind of all here. You know, it's a small area, but they got everything. They got food, you know. And the, they didn't really have any food, but there was a few, a few acre and trees in there. Um, I thought, man, they got, they got acorns. They got water bedding. I said, ah, this is, this is a pretty decent spot. So uh, I talked to my uncle and I was like, hey, is anybody hunting in there? He said, no. I said, you care if I hunt? He said, go get after it. It's all yours. So I go in there September of 22 and throw up a, a feeder and a stealth cam. Man. It was probably two, three days later. I was working. I went back on nights and I was working nights. I woke up two o'clock in the afternoon, rolled over one eye on it, checked my pictures. And this is the first picture I got on that property. It was this deer. Was there any any rumor mills floating around that there was a giant on the pro or, or on that property or near it? Has your uncle seen any big deer or uh, no, he's he's not much of a hunter at all. I mean, and he hadn't seen anything. And there's always on this in this area um you always hear that one guy oh man this deer crossed the highway in front of me he looked like a moose mm -hmm. um which that's that's every year you know that's usually like and, a 130 uh, inch buck they're like dude it was 200 i right, swear yeah. and then you see it and they're like all right that was a nice one but it wasn't 200 yeah exactly well uh no i hadn't i hadn't really heard anything but man i when i rolled over i seen this i was like I went and jumped out of bed, grabbed my wife, showed my wife. She's all pumped up, pumped for me. And she's not even a big hunter, but she was, she was, couldn't believe it. And uh, I sent that picture to my dad and he's like, do not tell anybody. <laughs> That's the first thing he said, don't show anybody. And uh, so anyhow, so that was in uh, September of 22. And man, this deer was not shy. I mean, I had a ton of pictures of him um, up until... Obviously, like every big deer, um, closer to October you get, more nocturnal they get. And went completely nocturnal, really. So one day, um, this is in, in 22, we were, I'd set up just a ground blind. There wasn't any any trees large enough to put a, a tree stand in. Because I, I like to get, you know, as, as high as I can, really. And there wasn't anything that I felt like I needed to put a stand in. So in that clearing, I by my feeder, I, I threw up my, my ground blind and I guess, I think I'm like 28 yards to the feeder. Uh, not a, not a very big clearing at all. And anyhow, I'm sitting there with my daughter. I took her out because I'd been getting a bunch of does into the feeder. And, and I was like, you know, I'll, I'll take her out so she can see some deer and wasn't even trying to be quiet. You know, we're, you know, talking, you know, I'm, you know, there's a few deer came by, so we're talking about the deer, and I kept hearing something behind me. And finally, I was like, you know, curiosity got me, and I was like, all right, I got to turn around and see what this is. I turned around, opened up the back of the blind, and this deer and a smaller buck are standing 50 yards behind me. And I have no shot through the brush. All I can see is horns. And there was a couple of acorn trees back there, a couple of red oaks, and that's really the only thing that year we had a, we had a pretty bad drought here. So there wasn't much to eat besides those few big red oaks. Um, and I was like, Oh my God. And I, we, I couldn't do anything. And it was, it was really funny. I'm sitting there and I, of course I turned around with my bow and, and tried to get set up just in case for some reason he came towards me a little bit. I could get it, stick an arrow through there. And uh, my daughter goes, why is your arrow shaking? <laughs> I was like, oh, baby, I wish you knew. <laughs> I wish you knew why that arrow was shaking. <laughs> and uh, so I had to sit there until um, dark, watch this deer walk away in the dark. And so after that, I was like, I seen where he went, where I thought the bedding area was. All right, I got you now. 
I'm, I'm smarter than you, you know? Yeah. Right. But I thought that for a second. And, uh, so I moved this blind, picked my blind up and moved it back to the trail in between where I thought the bedding and then just a few red oaks were. And probably two weeks later, um, I'm sitting back there and right at, right before dark, I see a little buck come out to my feeder. Well, now I'm 50 yards back from where I was on the other side of the brush and I could barely see my feeder but I was just trying to intercept him between where I thought the bedding area was. Now that deer came from the complete opposite direction. And I thought, nah, there's no way that big deer's with him. Five minutes later, this big deer walks out to my feeder from the opposite direction. And I had to sit there again mm. with no shot and watch him feed until dark. And at this point, and, he's the three-year-old 190? Uh, what I think he's, or no, I guess he would have been four, so five. Yeah, he would have been. I'm sorry, I did, he wasn't three when I said one ninety. He would have been four. Twenty one. Okay. He would have been four. Uh, we we judged him at six and a half when I took him. So so this would have made him five. He would have been five and a half. Uh, I got you. In twenty two. I got you. Sorry about that. But anyhow, he uh, he st- he he walks off in the darkness again on me, and I thought, well, that's it. You know. <laughs> That's, that's the last, you know, I seen him twice on the hoof and there's, I'm never going to see this deer. And I think honestly, by me moving that, me moving that blind, I messed up his, his area and he sensed that. And, and I, that's why he, he moved the the trail he was coming in, in on. I think he, he completely moved just because that blind was there and it threw him off. So it was all my fault. Um, so it made needless to say, I moved my blind back to where it was, left it alone, and yeah. and uh, never seen him again in 22. Matter of fact, my last picture of him was November 9th, and which what I, I always say that's when the rut starts here is a uh, second week of November, and sure enough, he's gone, and I'm like, well, all right, that's it, never gonna see him again. Uh, I was I was waiting all season to hear about him, somebody hitting him with a car, somebody shooting him, something. Never heard anything. So this whole time you've not told anybody but your dad. Or, or uh, a couple a couple buddies. A couple guys I work with that that work that live a long ways away from here <laughs> and uh didn't know where I was at. But any everybody who you know, I kind of felt that some of my good friends. I, I showed I showed uh, another good friend of mine, but uh he didn't know where it was. <laughs> Just do I had a big deer on camera. Hmm. but That's anyhow wild. um so like i said november 9th is the last picture disappears no pictures all 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 winter spring until june i decided to go back out and, and put my cameras out and uh fill my feeder and just to see what's out there see if it's worth hunting this year and i like i said i had had acquired my lease too and Sure enough, June rolls around and I get this picture of this deer and it is just a solid ball of of velvet out past his ears in June. And I thought, oh, there's no way. That's got to be him. Like <laughs> nothing else is that big in June. And where everything else is just spikes, you know, right. of velvet. And this deer's already got main beams in June. And so- I was like, all right. Up until this point, you think that that deer's just dead, or maybe he died of natural causes, or maybe he's in some uh, illegal hunter's freezer somewhere, or you know something along those lines. You completely yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, I, I had I never thought I'd see this deer again, and and where it is at, there's a highway and a county road on both sides of the property, so it could have easily been poached. Mm. Um, and then there's wheat fields around. He could have been, I mean, he could have went to, went to wheat in the, in the late winter and somebody killed him up there. Uh, I just had no idea. And so anyway, in June, I, I get these pictures and I thought, oh boy, all right, here we go. So I, I pretty much focused everything on, on this property and, and uh, keeping him on the property. That was the big thing is because, you know, I talked to some other people about that, about baiting and stuff. And, 
they're like, you know, how do you feel about baiting? I'm like, man, in Oklahoma, if you're not doing it, your neighbor is. I mean, mm-hmm. you can you can live on uh, this moral moral uh, chair of of uh, I'm I'm too good to bait. I'm like, man, that's fine. If I, I'm like I said, I'm all for it. If you don't want to bait, don't do it. Shoot them between bedding and and water or bedding and and the natural food source, whatever you want to do, do it. But if you're not baiting, your neighbor is. So that's that's how I felt about Amen. that. So, yeah. My buddies, on, my buddies on the lease, they have a nickname for me. They call me Master Bates on <laughs> for baiting. <laughs> that's just but but yet, but yet they hunt over a winter wheat field and and all that good stuff. But and they say it's natural, but I don't know how natural a monocrop is in a condensed <laughs> area. You know what I mean? So like, it's all the same yeah. thing. Yeah, exactly. It's kind of like like food, like you said, food plots. You got. You know, where'd all these these winter peas and and uh mm-hmm. and wheat and Brass clover come? <laughs> yeah, that, where'd all that come from in the middle of this this uh the con bottom? Yeah, it's nutrition, bro. <laughs> come on. Right. <laughs> so anyhow, I uh I was like I, I was I was focusing everything I had on on this deer. Um naturally, like I said, September comes around, he starts getting starts getting nocturnal and Right around uh, the 29th, I believe, 29th and 30th, both days of September, he comes out in the daylight. And I thought, all right, it's on. But he, he slipped up. Did he look about 260 with velvet on? He had to look significantly bigger, too. Oh, right? man. He did. And and I'm telling you right now, I, I could not say it. I could not tell myself that I had a 200-inch deer on camera. Mm-hmm. I, I just couldn't do it. Just, you know, I grew up watching the Outdoor Channel. and I've seen the juries. I've seen everybody in Iowa, Illinois, Ohio. They shoot, you know, 200 inch deers. And I I, I couldn't tell myself that I had a 200 inch deer on camera, you know, (laughs) but Mm -hmm. every, you know, everybody that I showed the picture to told me I did, but, uh, anyhow, uh, so he, he finally sheds his velvet. And and like you said, he, he still looked huge, you know, without Mm -hmm. velvet. Um, but in, in say into September, he slips up, starts coming in daylight, and, and I thought, all right, it's on. I, I got to be there October first, even though uh, David Payne over here tells me it's going to be ninety-two degrees on October first. I'm like, oh, that's that's going to be miserable, you know. And actually, had to work October first. Um, mm. We we had some extra work going on, and they they called me in to called me in to come work, and I was like, man, am I that guy? How that Got us from calling sick on October 1st. And uh, I had never had any morning pictures of him. So I'm like, all right, if, if I can get out of there, you know, at 3 30, if I can slip out, I can I could be in the stand by four. And, and I was pumping myself up all day about it. And then, you know, as the day went on and the hotter it got, I'm like, man, you know, that <laughs> AC, that AC and that recliner sure sounds good. Yeah. And on my way home, I talked myself in, in and out of hunting all the way home from work. And I finally get home and like, man, you can't kill him on the couch. So let's go. So I run in the house, change clothes, grab my bow, release and left. I mean, I didn't grab a backpack, a flashlight, a knife, nothing. And just ran out there and got in the blind as quick as I could. And I'm pouring sweat. I mean, I took a I bath and like a hot box. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. Sitting in the sun all day and, and I took a bath in some dead down wind or sent away or something and <laughs> tried to mask it. I'm sure I smelled like a goat anyway. And uh, so I'm sitting there sweating. Um, nothing's really happening. And then it's closer to dark. A doe come in and she was out there feeding in front of me. And as I was watching her, the wind, when I got there, the wind was perfect. And then I start watching this grass in front of me, and this grass is just swirling in front of me. And I was like, oh, no. And But she wasn't spooked by anything. She was just calm, and, and it just kept feeding out in front of me. And I thought, all right, as long as she stays calm, you know, we're going to be okay. But if she blows, I'm probably going to shoot her anyway. Um, but uh, then right before dark, a few, probably 30 minutes, 20, 30 minutes before dark, I see this little buck come out that he'd been running with all summer. And I thought, Oh, there's no way. And he comes out and he 
hops over the panels and starts feeding. And I turn and look to my left where he had came from. And this deer right here is standing 50 yards inside the brush as still as a statue. I mean, it was the, mo the most incredible thing really is just watching big deer. Now I haven't had the privilege of watching this big a deer in my life, but <laughs> right. just watching, watching how mature deer react, you know, how they move and stuff and how they, how they watch other deer's body language and whatnot. And that's exactly what he did. He stood there dead still and stared at that little buck and doe. And for what it felt like two hours, but it was really about 10 minutes. And I'm shaking so bad that I felt like I was going to cramp up. And I, and I was shaking and I had just up my bow to 75 pounds. And I'm sitting here thinking, man, can I even pull my bow back? I mean, <laughs> This is this is going to be embarrassing if I have to tell everybody this deer walked by and I couldn't draw my bow. Oh, I'd put both feet on the freaking pockets <laughs> of those limbs and uh, if I had to. So, uh, yeah, he uh, so he he's standing there and and I I would just kept looking. I would look at him and then look at my feet just to try to slow my heart rate down. Look at my feet. I look up, make sure he's still there. Well, I look up and he's gone. And I went, oh no. And then I look and he's standing there at 27 yards broadside. And yeah, the whole th me thinking I couldn't draw my bow back went out the window. I jerked that thing back so fast that matter <laughs> that he pinned me. I mean, pinned me instantly. Whether it was the sound of the arrow or whether it's me moving too fast or whatever, he pins me and turns and looks. And all this takes place and you know in in a, in seconds, but I'm sitting here trying to settle my pen. My pen looks like it's the size of a Coke bottle and sticking out there on the end of my, <laughs> end of my, my riser. And I'm like, and I finally get it settled, touch the release. And, uh, I hear a loud smack. He turns, tucks his tail and runs off where he came from. And I thought, all right, I got an arrow in him. You know, he tucked his tail. I heard a smack, you know, I got, it. I got it. And he goes out of sight pretty quick and, I, I couldn't wait any longer. I jumped out of the blind, left my bow in there, jump out of the blind. I run up to where he was standing and I can't find my arrow anywhere. And I'm looking around. There's no hair. There's no blood right there. I'm like, oh no. What did I hit? You know, at that point, I'm like, man, I, I hit him in the leg. I hit him somewhere. Right. And uh, I walk about 10 feet, 10 or 12 feet. And I look and I see two little bitty pin drops of blood. I mean, nothing really at all. I thought, oh no, this is this is bad. So I just turned around and left. I, I walked right past my blind, my bow, everything. Just walked right past it and head to the truck. And I'm calling my dad. I'm like, I got him, I got him. I couldn't even talk. I was I was so tore up, I couldn't talk. I'm like, I got him, I got him. And uh, he's like, all right, you think you made a good shot? So I think so. And he's like, all right, let's go to your house. I'll be there and I'll be there in a minute. We're going to give him at least an hour. We'll go back. And like I said, I only live two miles from this property. And uh, anyhow, dad gets here and he's laughing at me because I'm sitting here trying to put batteries in a flashlight. I'm shaking so bad. I can't even get the batteries in it. And so finally, you know, what, what felt like ages, you know, he's like, all right, let's, let's go out there. Let's, let's see what you got. You know, he's trying to be calm because because <laughs> I'm a I'm a wreck. So so he's trying to be calm. He's trying to be the calm one here. And anyhow, we get out there and, and man, we didn't make it 20 yards when we find good pink blood. And I'm like, all right, all right, I feel better now. Like I can start breathing a little bit, but still not still holding my breath. But I I'm, I feel a little bit better. And then it was it was weird, really weird blood trail. It wasn't steady. It was like every 20 feet. 30 feet we find blood but I'm you like, think okay, that's because he was hauling butt through there or do you I, think it was i just... think so now and uh well i found out later why but <laughs> i'll tell y'all in a second there so uh he's he's making these big bounds and there's a big there's a dry creek up there and i said all right he's laying in the bottom of that creek for sure get up to the edge of the creek deer's not there I'm like, oh no, if he climbed out of this creek, that means he's, he's doing fine. You know, I didn't, <laughs> he, he's got all four wheels if he can get out of this creek. Yeah. And 
so we get up the other side, find pick up the trail again on the other side of the creek, and and then we're out into an open pasture, uh, grass, uh, tall grass, and then that was terrible. Trying to track at night in a you know tall grass, and finally uh, we get up to a spot where we could tell he had he had fell down, and I thought, man, you know that's a good sign. You know he's he's running out of gas here. And then we find another spot where he fell down and another spot. And I'm like, man, he's, he's falling, but he's not staying down. You know, I don't know what's going on here. Well, dad was like, man, I think we just need to back out. We need to leave. You know, we'll come back first thing in the morning. And I was like, man, let's, you know, he's going to ruin if he sits out here, it's 90 degrees at, at eight o'clock and, and he's going to ruin, you know, if we leave him out here overnight. And there was a, a small thicket out in the middle of this field. And I was like, let's go to that thicket. If he's not there, you know, let's, we'll back out. And so we started easing that direction and man, that grass was so tall. I was 10 yards from this deer before I seen him. And when I, when I laid eyes on it, I lost it. <laughs> it was, I, I, I couldn't function. I couldn't talk. I mean, it was, I was an absolute wreck. But man, it was a, uh, it's, it was quite the experience and what well, felt like it what felt like hours was was just a matter of minutes you know from the highs and lows of, of trailing a deer like this mm -hmm. how uh so in total how how far did he make it oh uh, on onyx i mapped blood because i had my onyx app pulled up and every time we would find blood i would make a pin and uh later i went back and, and looked at that p i looked at that trail and it was 253 yards is how far that that deer went um but, you know, I, we, we get up to him and dad's like, where did you hit this deer? And I was like, well, I don't know. Cause he was, he was laying on, on, uh, on that one side and, and there's not a mark on him. And he was like, where'd you hit this deer? And, and we roll him over and found out that when I took the shot and I still see it plain as day picture in my head. When I took the shot, that deer ducked string and turned towards me. And the only thing I can think of is when he ducked and turned towards me, I hit him right there in the neck. It cut wow. that main artery right here. There's a line mm -hmm. right there on the neck. And that that's right where that arrow hit. And I felt so I felt super lucky at that point because I had thought this whole time that I'd made a great shot. Yeah. <laughs> By the blood we were finding, you no, know, we're finding good pink blood. And no, I, I'd gotten extremely lucky. But I mean it's that's how it goes. I mean, I I did that same thing with a recurve this year. Like hit him right there and it was it was like a hundred and fifty yard blood trail, it looked like a water hose the whole time. Oh yeah. And I give you credit. Oh, let's go ahead. No, go ahead. No, finish it. Finish it. I cut no, you off I, too many times. I, I was just gonna say that it it'll give you that feeling that you did hit him in the lungs because it does have that that oxygenation in the blood, like the bubbles are there. You're like, ooh, I smoked him. Yeah. Like the whole time I thought I hit this recurve buck in the in the lungs, but I was like, I didn't ever see the arrow hit him. Like, and I definitely didn't cut through him like butter. So it just confused me until I got up on him. I was like, oh makes a lot more sense did you get a lot of penetration or did you just like slice through them at the hunter's advantage we live by the kiss slogan you were not supposed to tell them that no i meant we like to keep it simple stupid all jokes aside exodus is the definition of keeping it simple let's say you aren't really sure what arrow setup you should run the exodus arrow builder will help you build the right arrows for your exact setup or if you don't have time to change those trail cam batteries in the dog days of summer, Exodus has a great selection of cell cameras and regular trail cameras. And if you pair them with one of their solar panels, you'll be set for a long while. I've shot over a dozen deer and a big old black bear in Saskatchewan with these arrows, and I trust them to fly right and get the job done. And they have something for everyone with the Exodus NIS micro diameter arrows or the Exodus MMTs. So if you want to save money on Exodus arrows, cell cameras, or anything else they got on their website, make sure to check out ExodusOutdoorGear.com and use code HA10 for 10% off. Once again, that's exodusoutdoorgear.com and make sure to use code HA10 for 10% off at checkout. Now let's get back to the podcast. Man, I sliced it. That, I, that arrow was nowhere to be found. I, I still to this day, I mean, 
I, I don't know where it, it went to, whether it did get a little bit with they're stuck in him and he broke it off somewhere. I don't know. I mean, but I, it did. It, it just was a perfect clean slice. Like you did it with a pocket knife. And, uh, he, it was like you said, it just, it was the whole time thinking that you got a double lung and why is this deer running 200 yards? And then you get up there like, Oh, okay. That was, it's all luck. I mean, like I said, that, that pin on that bow was about the size of a Coke bottle. So I'm not right. saying I was, I wasn't saying I was dead set, dead steady. Well, those, those Matthews have like aggressive, like I think Matthews have somewhat aggressive cams. Like that Valley kind of comes back pretty hard mm-hmm. when, when you hit that final rock and you're like, all right, two years, 230 inches in front of me, monster. And you're going to settle in an anchor to shoot. What is it in slow motion? What do you remember about it? Like, were, were you like, is this really happening? Cause that's how I always feel when I get, pull back on a good one like oh my god this is really gonna happen I black out. yeah exactly <laughs> I, I and you know I, I kind of felt both ways like i still picture i can picture everything in my head to this day what happened and and where i had and where my pin was and my and when i squeezed the trigger and him turning ducking towards me ducking into it i guess you'd say i can picture all of it in my head but i and i like i said you know i i came up that front leg and, and when I touched when I touched that bottom third I pulled the trigger and uh or so I thought and uh <laughs> hey <laughs> and I like but then at the same time like at the short few minutes after the shot you know I was just I was such a adrenaline rush that it was all black I mean I, I couldn't believe that this this actually happened, you know. Like I said, seeing him twice last year, all the pictures. I mean, he the just it was just a uh, it was so overwhelming that I, I almost did black out. <laughs> so you you finally walk up on this deer, you put your hands around him. What's going through your mind right now? Uh, relief. <laughs> I mean, it, it felt like I was I was carrying a, a hundred pound backpack, you know, with me that through that whole blood trail. Uh, and just just relief and and I mean I like I said I was an emotional wreck you know and my dad he's sitting there he's like what have you done what have you done <laughs> I mean that, I that's what I was gonna say is you see that like you see it all the time when someone not all the time but you see when someone shoots a big one like that is like what have you done or what w-, like what have you done is literally like the line you hear people yeah. say when it's like. Cause it's so undescribable. It's like, I don't even know what you did that. What am I looking at right now? <laughs> that was exactly it. I mean, like I said, my, my dad's, he's been hunting all over the, all over the country and all over Oklahoma. And he'd never, never even put his hands on anything like this. And, and, uh, so it was, he was, he was in pure amazement about it. I assume you were snapping pictures, calling everybody in your contact list. Cause that's dang sure what I would have been doing. So the, the people that did know about it, um, I, I sent them just the deer, just a side, one, one side of the horns and sent it to them. And I said, I got him. And uh, then that picture in minutes, I'm talking minutes. I had <laughs> people that I had people that, that didn't even uh, know about the deer messaging me. It was like, what did you kill? Cause you know, that one, side of him laying on the ground everybody got sent out and everybody's like what did you kill what'd you kill you know let me see him let me see him and uh sorry i'm having having trouble with these stupid headphones but uh anyhow he's like everybody's you know saying what'd you do and and a uh, matter of fact uh whitney reed uh, she's on the buck venture staff um mm-hmm. i'm friends with her went to school with her actually and uh she i sent it to her and her husband and she's sitting there with Jeff Danker and they FaceTime me. And uh, so I'm FaceTiming them, you know, I'm trying to show what I got, you know, in the dark and everything else. And my phone's on 5% and naturally. And uh, so Jeff's like, man, you know, how, he's, you know, what do you think? He, how do you think he's going to go? I was like, man, I, I think he's close to 200 and Jeff's like, dude, I've seen a lot of deer. That deer's well over 200. Congratulations. <laughs> and then my phone, then my phone dies. 
<laughs> oh no! <That's> awesome. <laughs> yeah. When do you uh, when do you put a tape on them? So luckily, um, a buddy of mine, Austin Stevens, he's also with with Buck Ventures. He lives here, um, just north of me, and he has a walk-in cooler. So first thing I did after we took our initial pictures in the field of with the deer just with with iphones and stuff you know i had my wife come out and, and take pictures for me um i i took him up there as fast as i could because like i said it's so hot you know that night you know we're in that talking about in the 80s that night 70s 80s so as fast as i could i got him up there to the cooler and got him propped up in the cooler because we had planned on taking good daytime pics the next day mm -hmm. so uh luckily got him in a cooler that night and uh and the next day we got out there and got some good daylight photos of him and put a tape on him then. And when we first put a tape on him, of course, we got, you know, two people measuring and one person doing math and ended up coming up. We, we, we scored him really, really conservatively and came up with 229. And I was like, there's no way. Like, we did something wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and like, where's all this where's this coming from and so uh i was like man if if we never get another tape on him i'm staying i'm saying 229 that's i'm fine with that and that's uh, my first question is just how how would you go about scoring them like because there's there's certain things you look at them because because i got a little uh a couple pictures pulled up right now and it's it to official score it, I'd hate to be the, the guy to do that because that's a lot of time there. Yeah, that was that was us. I mean, it took us quite a while, and, and we're by no means pros at it. You know, we've just we've just measured a few, you know, typical eights right. and ten pointers that we've shot. So we were just measuring all the inches of antler he had. If it was an inch long, we were putting a tape on it. So we come up with that just total inches was was a, a two twenty nine and. Then, like you said, man, I took him to the Backwoods show, and I wheel him up there at the Backwoods show, and everybody, of course, most everybody knew about it by then. And uh, one of the guys there, he looks at it, and he goes, can't wait to do that one. Because, <laughs> <laughs> like you said, it's gonna you're going to have to block out your calendar for uh, yeah. to get an official score on this one. Jeez. So what were some of the more notable, like, you know, measurements on that deer. Like I'm curious on beams width, and then greatest mass. Like what were some of those? It almost looks like his mass gets greater. You the know, palmation. I, yeah. Yeah. The further it gets yeah, to the it, base. It sure does, man. He's five and a half at the base and he's like six and he's like six something on his fourth measurement. Mm. So what did he mass, end up having? Like 45, 50 inches of mass, something like that. I think, man, I have to pull the pull the paper up, but I really do think he's close to fifty inches of mass. Jesus Christ! Yeah, That's alone, amazing. and then then he, uh, the beams. Uh, I'm thinking beams are are around twenty five or something like that. What about width? Uh, inside he's like nineteen, nineteen and a half inside. He wears nineteen well. He looks. Yeah, he's he one of those ones that inside yeah. well that mass is hurting him on his spread it's like he's bringing his horns closer together well that's the deal he's like 19 inside he's like 24 outside <laughs> <laughs> that's insane that happens when you got baseball bats for horns yeah and you know that was that was the thing is between 22 and 23 which i didn't care in 22 if he walks out 22 i'm sticking him but oh. 22 to 23 i think he gained 20 inches of 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 uh points or 20 inches of horn just just over a year having a lot better a lot better food available a lot better uh nutrients around and and i think he got 20 inches on him so from 22 to 23 what what i mean i know this is a lot to look at but what did he have and what did he not have i mean did he have that what is that a drop time on the on the right side or yes um the drop time the drop time there, um, he had it. And matter of fact, I think I think it might have been longer in 22, but it looks like he bumped it in velvet, and it, it kind of turned it down, and uh, he actually stunted it in velvet. But all of his kickers that are sticking off back there, 
all of those are, are a couple inches longer on both sides. Mm -hmm. Um, and then obviously his mass, I think he got, he gained a lot of mass in, in one year. Oh, that's awesome. So are those 22 sheds and obviously the 21 sheds, are those out there somewhere getting eaten by squirrels or does somebody have those? Man, I have walked every inch of that property that I have permission <laughs> on, and uh, I cannot find them. I haven't heard of I haven't heard of them anywhere. I mean, I would buy them. I mean, hey, if, if somebody sees this, you got sheds this deer. I'll, let's talk. But, well, uh, I can find them for you. You may go out there and smoke a cigarette and accidentally drop it. We're gonna yeah, no kidding. <laughs> but okay, so that's another thing about this deer. Like I said, I'm hunting that forty acre. Uh, 40 acre property with 20 acres of timber in it and uh or th this pasture was 40 acres i think the whole property ended up being like 60 but um like i said 20 acre block of timber and i had people two miles north of me with pictures i had people two miles south of me with pictures i had people three miles west of me with pictures this deer had a huge range that's amazing that much of a roamer and that big and also kind of like you said like it right next to a highway or a county road or whatever you said that's extremely yeah, both of them. that's that's insane a deer of that caliber can make it that long legal or not it was uh, yeah exactly um you know i've never been i've never been you know pressed with a <laughs> a deer like this standing next to the fence <laughs> by the road uh, so i can't say you know whether or not what would have happened but that I, I mean, there's a lot of people that wouldn't, they wouldn't, they wouldn't think twice about busting this deer off the road. Uh, Big deer make people do stupid things. And uh, absolutely. that's, that's just a sad truth. Oh, you're talking about the mobile hunting wagon. That's what I've heard some people call it. Yeah. The, the blind that has wheels. Some people call <laughs> right. it. Yeah. Yeah, blind on wheels for sure. Yeah. That's, I mean, it's so cool to see one of them, a buck like that shot legal shot with a compound bow because you, Usually in 2023, 2024, you know, somebody has a cell cam picture of this who tells somebody who gets wind of a buck like this, who ends up driving on the road and shooting it illegally. Like it just seems like that happens more often than you see people even killing them half the time. So it's just, it's really cool to see it come full circle for, you know, and get killed the right way. Like that, that honors that deer in the way it needed to be. And I think that's yeah, really absolutely. cool. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's, uh, like you said, you know, in this day and time, you know, that word gets out and if it doesn't get poached, at least somebody comes in and leases it out from under you. You know, I mean, fortunately I was on, I was on family property, so I didn't think that was going to happen, but you you never know money talks. I mean, you know, what are you willing to pay for a lease with a deer like this on it? I mean, so, and the other thing, like you said, man, I didn't even think about it until I was talking to the, 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 uh, your buddies at Outdoor Defiance, and uh, you know, had I just been sitting there with no idea in the world about this deer, and he just stumbles in front of me, and I shoot him, you know, all those people who also had pictures, now they're they're blaming me for poaching. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, if, if if that had happened, you know, if I just just dumb luck, he walks in front of me, and and uh, and you know, now I'm in trouble. So that is true. That's what happened to the huff buck. <laughs> You know, uh, he, he went out there, I, didn't know anything about that deer and he ended up shooting it. And I, I mean, I don't know if he said it was neighbors or what, but he's, he, he had a, I don't want to say an investigation, but he's had a lot of complaints about that, which are obviously untrue, but I mean, there's some jealous people out there and I wouldn't put it past them. Exactly, man. Have, so have you had, I mean, I know you talked about people commenting about the high fence and all that other stuff. And I feel like. Heck, even, even though as small as the hunting community actually is, you'd think people would be more supportive of each other. Have you have you had any of the dark side of the hunting media? I mean, God bless the guy who shoots a big deer in 2024 because it seems like all hell is to pay, right? <laughs> Everyone that's jealous. But have you have you experienced any of that? Uh, you know, I, and man, I just, I, I, I scroll through the comments, you know. I mean, I've had, like I said, it's, I've had the privilege of having him in, in, North America Whitetail, Field the Scream, uh, Buckmasters, all of those publications. And, you know, you scroll through the comments and it's like first or second high fence. And I, I'm like, man, 
I've never been the guy to, to, to put crappy comments on stuff, but like, you know, who hurts, who peed your Cheerios this morning? <laughs> at, at the first thing you did, yeah. you know, the first thing you did when you woke up was decided to make a, a, a comment on a picture of somebody's deer, you know? I mean, if, if you would have commented on it, said needs another year or something, I mean, I'd, I'd respect that, but <laughs> uh, no, I wouldn't, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's so dumb. You know, all these, all these pictures of great deer, which Oklahoma, man, I mean, we could talk about that, but Oklahoma is putting out some, mo- yeah, yeah. Yeah. Never mind. No, they're not. <laughs> There's no deer. Yeah. Here. They're extinct. North Texas, North Texas, <laughs> North Texas is put, North Texas is putting out some big deer, but uh, exactly. No, um, man, it, it is it's insane of all the deer that have been taken this year and, and in just the stupid comments underneath every single picture. So other than just crappy comments, I don't think, unless I'm just too dumb to know, I don't think I've, I've been a part of any bad press. Well, I, I'll be honest. When I saw the picture of that buck, you, you shot the deer opening day season, right? You said, yes, sir. Yeah. I remember seeing that picture and going, what the hell is that? Like mm-hmm. that did not, it doesn't look now. I know these deer are anomalies. But that deer literally looks like it's carrying two Louisville sluggers with <laughs> just the trees coming out each side. It and then the presence that that buck has from the front when you were holding him, I was like, that looks like an escapee with dark horns. But you know, all those high fence deer do the, the discolorations and of the horns and stuff. It's usually like a dead giveaway. That buck has those beautiful yeah. caramel natural horns. I was like, that looks like a high fence deer with caramel coated horns. It did, exactly. but it's not. You know. No, it's it's not, and and it it not saying I was upset, but man, like I had some pictures of uh, a couple of days, probably a week prior. Man, he had that like almost cherry cherry red, you know, fresh out of velvet, that cherry red horn, and mm-hmm. just in the matter of a matter of a week, they got darker and darker. And I was I was, mm-hmm. you know I was kind of kind of wishing I caught him a, a little bit earlier, but but it, I mean, needless to say, it doesn't matter, but. Yeah, it was an absolute beauty, beautiful deer. And, and you know, what really surprised me about him, obviously he was, you know, king of his area. Uh, nobody's pushing him around. But this deer's body was nothing. I mean, I've killed – both of those deer behind me had bigger bodies than this deer, I think. I've heard that, though. I've, I've Don Higgins, we talked to Don about that. And so yes. Don Higgins, Illinois, he skilled like three, 200 inch bucks. We asked him about that. And he said that every 200 inch buck that he shot has been like 20 or 30 pounds less than like an average big buck in his area. I don't know if that's because of all the nutrients go to the, putting that antler on, I would think. And also here's another Makes theory. Sense. If you're carrying around a seven, eight, six, seven, eight pound horn, whatever it is, instead of a one, one fourth that weight it probably burns a few more calories that's true i mean i don't know the whole science of it like you said but man it i would just imagine that they're putting so much effort so their body's putting so much effort into those horns that you know they're everything they got's going there and you know i noticed up at the backwoods show there in oklahoma city uh, that all of those really really big deer um they all looked like this deer body wise like none of them just looked Outside of one deer, there was one deer up there that looked like it might have weighed three hundred pounds. God, but it was a it was a monster. But there, all the other really big, the deer over two hundred inches all had the same body top. Mm. That's, That's pretty sweet. Yeah, That's really cool. Yeah. So, what's next for you? Like, uh, I, I know you kind of touched on it earlier. You know, uh, you getting back to reality with the one fifty. But let's say there's not a one fifty that steps out. Are you? Are you uh, taking a shot, or are you going to let it? I guess. What's your goal to sum it up? You know, I've I've actually been thinking about that. Um, and after I shot this deer, I was four days later. I was in the blind again, um, down on my lease, and I had a, a deer that come in down there. I, I'm sorry, it was actually the same deer that I that I ended up taking with my rifle. Um, I seen him four days later after this deer. So almost had a really cool year. But uh, <laughs> anyhow, he came in, the wind swirled, he he boogered and left. But I was I caught myself after that. I was shaking just as bad as with this deer. Um, but but to answer your question, man, I I really don't know. Uh, 
I had the, the I was lucky enough in it was November the 17th of last year. I had the best day I've ever had in the woods. I had seven bucks within bow range mm. in one morning set. Seven different bucks. And and it's on my on my Instagram reels. I had got a, a pick I took some videos. I was quick to the draw on my phone and took some videos of those bucks running by. But man, it was it was an absolute, just absolute craziness that morning. And I actually drew back on two different bucks that morning and let them go. <laughs> uh, just, just, I mean, I grabbed my bow four different times just because I would hang it back up and 10 minutes later, something else would run by. And we need to send you a video camera to get B-roll for us or something. <laughs> geez, I don't know that that'll ever happen again, but man, that was, and that's another thing. I'm going to, I'm going to start taking a camera with me just for, for, Mornings like that, whether you kill anything or not, having that type of morning is is something to to remember. Oh, and, absolutely. Uh, but no, I I really I, I think I'm just going to focus on uh focus on a, a mature deer. Um, you know whether that's a, a 150 or a, a 135. I mean, if I think he's mature, he'll be as old as he'll ever get. Amen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you you know it's an elite club. When you start talking about people that have shot two hundred inch deer, there's not a whole lot of people that could step into that circle. But and I always hear the, oh well, that guy's run, and I I can't I can't wait. So I ever shoot a two hundred, I'm gonna say run me, and I'm gonna go back and do exactly what you did, going for a one thirty again that next weekend. I think that's that's awesome. It's a full circle moment. You I mean you chase a deer like that and you pray to to ever get eyes on one not you know let alone have a multi-year quest for one but i think that's a that's a full circle moment and i don't i don't think that run to you at all no man I, and and if you ever do lose that feeling man if you don't don't start shit walking in i mean you do need to hang it up that's when you need to retire because like i said four days later i had a buck walking in and and was shaking just as bad so it's more of it's more chasing a feeling than it is than it is chasing a, a certain deer. Yeah, that's true. There's always harder things to do. Like you can you can pick up a trad bow, you can go the Tim Wells route and have a blow dart and a and a tree spear or something Water like trump. that. I mean, <laughs> there's always more yeah, you I can think, do for sure. I think I commented that on your post the other day on TikTok. Oh, oh yeah, <laughs> must have missed that. If you're not, that's if you're not. If you're not um, if you're not up in a saddle uh, hunting with a trad bow, you're not doing it right. I said, if you're not hunting like Tim Wells, you're not doing it right. Oh, yeah. That was the one, Jake, you were talking about blue jay feathers and all that crap. Oh, yeah. 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 yeah I remember yes. that one. I That's probably missed that right. comment because I don't know. I There are certain days I don't even look at the comments because you get those people that that's what they do for fun and maybe as a full-time job is just comment negative stuff. So, there's there's certain days you wake up you're like I better not look at that or I'm gonna say something stupid so <laughs> must have been yeah. one of those days. Oh, that was pretty good. That's hilarious though because we had a guy the other day that was a, a boat captain that commented on our stuff and it was like two podcasts in a row. He said something like super negative, <laughs> and I just I got on my personal and he had the same YouTube name as he did Instagram, and I went to his Instagram and I I messaged him I said I was really polite. I said, hey, it sounds like you hate our podcast. What's going on? He didn't read it. He went, deleted his other two comments, and now he's commenting on our YouTube videos like positive. He's like, yeah, I totally agree with what you guys are saying. And, like, I was like, are you serious? I don't understand that. Man, like I said, you know, what What makes somebody just wake up and just that's, that's what they want to do that day is comment negatively on stuff. I, I never understood it. No consequences. Well. That's why. Yeah, that's true. And just like Christian said, most of them, if if you just confront them, not a lot of people like confrontation nowadays. And even if it's over the internet, they're like, oh, uh, I didn't mean it. I was just joking. And then they're cool, right. which is fine. Like, you know, but we definitely have our alt accounts where we'll uh, defend ourselves. On, <laughs> <Alt but. accounts>. <laughs> <laughs> that's there you awesome. Go. Well, with three uh, with three Oklahomans here, I, I want to. I want to do some uh, transition to some Oklahoma talk for a little bit, if that if that works for you. Oh yeah. Okay, so there's a Oklahoma. We talked about it earlier. Obviously, you call it what you want, Oklahoma or North Texas or the land of small deer for anyone that wants to come hunt here. How do you feel about 
current regs and stuff going on in Oklahoma, whether it's, and let, let's start here. What, what do you think about two tags for a non-resident and over the counter and about as cheap as they come in a, in the bow hunting state? Does that bother you at all? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I'll never, I don't know. don't want to speak too negatively of the people in Oklahoma city, but I, I don't, uh, I don't agree with a lot of things. Um, one, I, I do think we need to go to one buck in about six does. <clears throat> and then I, I do think we need to, you know, catch on the trend. If it all does go back to conservation, we do need to raise the, the non-resident tags. I mean, with land prices pretty, pretty reasonable. Now, after deer like this, uh, get posted around. I don't know how how the land prices are going to go, but uh, land prices halfway decent, and then cheap cheap out of state licenses. Man, I I think they got to do something. I mean, I don't want to go the Colorado route. I don't want to charge somebody a thousand dollars to come kill a deer. But also, you know, I think three hundred bucks is is pretty cheap, pretty cheap for somebody to come to come shoot a a, a deer of this six this, this caliber. Yeah, six deer, well, yeah. And, and then and then pretty 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 good good quality deer at, at that. Do we have a limit like Kansas? Because obviously Kansas is obviously a, a one buck, and their non resident license is like five hundred and fifty bucks if you draw, draw out. Yeah, and it's a draw. So there's therefore there's a limited amount of attestators that are able to flood you know their public lands or you know hunt private somehow some way there. Does Oklahoma have that? cap on non-resident licenses or no mm -mm. not to my knowledge okay. they don't i didn't think so but i just double checking well there's different systems too you got kansas like a pure draw and then you have like a not like nebraska just moved to a non-resident capped so it's like non-resident tags over the counter up until three thousand, then we're done they're gone mm. right oklahoma is come as you are come come one come all that's how they are and i i understand it but if you look at any any hunting show everyone if you looked at five seven seven years ago there was never a strip to oklahoma nope. now every one of those shows it's like here's my hunt in oklahoma here's my hunt in oklahoma here's my hunt in oklahoma i'm on the lease with blake shelton in oklahoma everybody's coming yeah that could, and it is i think it is because of those favorable regulations because it's like it's like two bucks and also there's not an incentive structure to manage for trophies because it's like oh there's a nice buck walking by me at 650 that i can't really tell exactly what it is let's take a gamble on that one and I'll get a big one on the next one. You know, imagine how you yeah. would, you would shoot differently in a different state. If that was the regs, if you got two tags in Kansas, I'd be taking a gamble on the first one. Right. Exactly. I mean, I've, I've had the privilege of hunting Illinois um, twice and man, I was up there that first time and I passed up on, I passed up several bucks up there in Illinois. Cause you know, you're like, I'm in the land of giants. I'm, we were hunting, right next to Pike County. Um, so I'm like, they're here. I mean, they're, they're here. There's big deer here. I've seen the property we were on. It, there'd been some big deer taken. And so I held out and I ate a, ate a tag sandwich the first time I went up there. And so then the next time I went up, I ended up taking a, taking a smaller buck on the last afternoon. I mean, just basically, so I didn't eat a tag sandwich, but you know, in, in saying that, you know, I didn't didn't really help the I didn't help you know the state of Illinois by doing that, but uh, you know, also, you know, you got like you said, there's more a lot more people being able to come to Oklahoma and hunt than than Illinois, as far as non-residents, and you got all those people, you know, the last afternoon, you know, they're shooting a, a six a two year old six pointer just so they don't need a tag sandwich. Well, and yeah. I'm with you. Come, sh come, shoot your two year old six pointer, but you get one. One. You get, you get one. Like, and I get it from the perspective of like, if you know, if you look at the stats, the the argument that maybe the DWC or other people will bring up is, well, the majority of people never shoot two bucks, so people don't take advantage of that. Well, that's true, but then you also have the outliers that like hunt near Jake that. Yeah, but they might not shoot two bucks, but them and their family shoot five, six bucks off 20 acres, you know? So yep. there has to be a, there has to be a line drawn there. And I, I, I'm, wouldn't even be opposed if they changed it to 
two buck tags for a resident and one for a non-resident. That's a step in the right direction, at least. Yeah, I think yeah. so. Baby steps, you know, and, you know, I, I really hate to to say that, I, you know, I want any regulations, any stronger regulations, you know, it, there's a two part of that. You know, one, I want this, the deer population to do better. Um, but on the other side of that, you know, the, you know, the, the I don't know what you want to, how you want to say it, discontent for the government. Um, yeah. you know, you don't want, Hell yeah, don't want that. <laughs> don't want, you don't want, you don't want the, you know, your government telling you what, what you can and can't do. Uh, because you know, what is it, what does it turn into I'm not saying Oklahoma will, and I, I pray it never does, but you know what it's saying, you know, what's going on in Colorado and California, uh, you know, was it, you know, you start with one buck and then it goes to one buck, one doe, and then one deer total for the year. And then, you know, when, you know, when does the regulation stop, you know, and then, cause uh, not, not to get off on a, a whole different topic here, but man, I, I talked about it the other day and, and I really feel strongly on this. You know, I watched a, a podcast with uh, Cam Haynes a, a while back and he was like, the anti hunters are winning. He said, because they're all on the same team. He said, they all want hunting to go away. They don't care if it's bear or deer or elk. You know, they want hunting to go away in general. And, you know, and, and he said, you know, the, the pro hunters are all against each other. You know, the, the deer hunters are against the, against the elk hunters and the bear hunters are against the, the, uh, deer hunters and the, the recurve compound crossbow hunters are against each other. And he's like, you know, we're losing. So, you know, whatever you talk about regulations and stuff, you know, that kind of is in the back of my mind, you know, we don't, well, don't want any more regulations on the hunting industry, anything to, to discourage people from hunting because we are losing as, as a group, we're losing right now. Yeah. Yeah. Which that's, that's a very, very good point. But then again, it could kind of fall on the line of, you know, this is for once something that I would say the majority of the residents are somewhat asking for, or at least these sort of changes. Now, that doesn't mean, okay, Oklahoma, the people at OKC say, okay, they want regulations now. Let's ban trail cameras. No, that's not what we're saying. Don't Please don't do that. But I think, I think, what am I trying to say here? I think I lost my train of thought, dead gummit. Down with the government. <laughs> yeah, no. Anarchy. No, that's, that's not what I'm saying. Uh, son of a gun. Okay, yeah. Where I was going with that is uh, you want to kind of, adapt to the people who's keeping the hunting tradition alive right like all the hunters are paying for the tags licenses so so we're we're keeping this tradition alive and so wouldn't you somewhat now with with the point you brought up in mind wouldn't you somewhat kind of want to adapt to what the people want per se because what because what will these regulations do right they will probably hopefully increase the buck to doe ratio obviously more bucks but also bigger class bucks which will make this state more desirable than it is to hunt so maybe one day it could become that kansas that iowa that or whatever where people can come here and shoot big bucks and they're willing to fork over money just like we do we pay 550 bucks to put in for kansas or we hope to draw out for iowa one day or whatever it may be where it comes more desi desirable and will profit more for that for that uh in return less deer getting shot because a you know only one buck tag but also b you know people are are also going to be unsuccessful even if they do put in and all that stuff you, you kind of get what i'm saying here oh absolutely i mean it, it's a double-edged sword you know I, you know you don't want any more regulations but you do want the the ones that we do have you do want to help and and like we were pointing out with the one buck and the raising the rates it it, it all would help the state of oklahoma in, in in the long run, I, I do believe uh, because, I, like I said, I, I think we have good enough people in in the in government here, at least a little more common sense than the places out west. Uh, I don't think we're going to get to that point, but but I, I do think we do we do need to change something uh, with with the deer in Oklahoma, man. It, it, like you said, it's and like you, we 
I don't know many people that fill all their all their deer tags like you said, but then I know people that fill them the first weekend of rifle season. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, there there's with the e check system and the way we have it here. I don't think they really have an idea how many deer are taken in Oklahoma. Well, and that's uh, we actually had. I, again, I don't want to say any names because I don't want to like people to think we're holding them in a bad light because that's absolutely n- not what we're doing. But their argument to that is Oklahoma has that resource. And so if they have that resource available, then they're going to allow, you know, that, that many deer to get shot. And so, you know, what's your rebuttal to that? Oh, you talking about just the deer numbers being the resource? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, like, we have we have the resource which the deer numbers to sustain like all these out of state people flooding in and buying the tags. So kind of what's your rebuttal to that? That would be, you know, somewhat a good point. I think we do. We do have the deer. Like there's there's mm-hmm. no shortage of deer, man. I tell you, I've been to Illinois twice. I seen more deer in one afternoon here than I did in, in uh uh two weeks in Illinois. <laughs> um <laughs> and uh so so we definitely do have the deer and like we we brought up earlier you know you got a good a good wheat field in january there's 150 deer out there yeah um and so that's where they're getting their numbers from you know they're rolling through there checking those fields and stuff at night and and getting their numbers but i i think the the doe our buck to doe ratio is jacked i don't i don't care who you are i'll argue with any biologist and i'll take you out to places but uh but I, I do think we need to get that under control. And I think the one buck, the one buck limit would, would really help that at least for a couple of years. Now, if we go back to two later, that would be great. But I think one buck is plenty for here. It's interesting too, because uh, another rebuttal, my, my uncle always says like, why punish people that hunt all over the state? What if you did regions like, as like five zones? right? You got your four core, your four quadrants and then your panhandle. And it's like, you can shoot a buck, you can get two bucks, but only one can come from each zone. So it's like you hunt in Northeast, you might have to travel the Southwest, right? You're distributing that strain on the resource, maybe to somewhere else that has more deer or different deer. And the reality is if you did that, most people aren't the kind of guys that are going to pack up and go three hours and go hunt somewhere else. So it's like, you're probably getting one buck reality the only people that are going to get two are going to be those guys that are hardcore and want to push it hey yeah i'm all for that you know i haven't actually thought of that but it's like that uh you know in parts of the state with turkeys you know there's part of the state you know where you can you can only kill one turkey or you know other other places you can kill two um but i'm i'm completely okay with that man if you're that hardcore and you want to you want to pack up and you want to hunt down in in the big timber in the southeast and you want to go all the way up to woodward and hunt up there i mean more power to you yeah and there's not a one size fits all i think you have to take a step back and say what's best for the resource and then from a biologist perspective what is best for the resource the most bucks the biggest bucks i could tell you for selfishly from a bow hunter it's like the most bucks and the biggest that's what yeah. i want you know like more four-year-olds and, and what's going to keep people interested though is it going to be a lot of small bucks or is it going to be you know a, a, a decent amount of quality bucks you want quant- quantity over quality or quality over quantity right and and like i said going to that one buck limit you know i know a lot of people who have went out opening day of a uh, a bow season or the opening week of bow season and they shoot the first thing that walks by which i mean like we went back to if that's what you want to do do it but they shoot the first thing that walks by, they shoot a two year old, uh, eight pointer. And, uh, then, you know, like, Oh, I'm going to hold out for a big one, you know, the rest of the season. Mm-hmm. And, and, but you know, you do away with that, that option. Okay. He just passed up four does to shoot that two year old eight point. You know, if he didn't have that option, he's going to shoot one of those does first. If you only got a one buck limit. You know, he's going to pass that little buck up, and if you if you're hungry, or you want some some freezer meat. I mean, by all means, shoot the does. Uh, you get six of them, so I mean, you might as well fill those tags first before. But I think, like I said, most people really realistically, people are only shooting two or three deer total, buck yeah. or doe. So you do that one buck limit, and uh, th- with all these doe tags, you know, 
October rolls around, man, I'm going to fill the freezer with a doe. Now I'm going to hunt my, I'm going to hunt a, a, a big buck. So that's the way I look at it. Well, those big mature bucks got more meat on them too. So the meat argument's not a, that's not there either, but I, that's oh, a good God. point. I like thinking about the incentive structure and experience and what keeps somebody in it. Cause I went, I've been scouting a piece of property here in Texas. That's a draw hunt. And I walked out the other day and I saw over a hundred deer. There were two wads, one wad of about 60, one wad of about 40. And when I saw all those deer, I about dribbled down my legs. I was so pumped and I kept binoing them. And there was, there wasn't a buck in that, in that wad over 125, 100, maybe high one twenties. And I was like, damn, I'm looking, I've seen a hundred deer today and a probably 20 bucks and not one over 120. And there were 60 does. I was like, some of these need to die like 60, 80 does. And there's just too many deer. They can't get big in that spot. Right. And yep. what it, it would make me a lot more motivated if I, if I walked out there and it's like, all right, I saw 20, but damn, there was a couple big ones in there, you know, kind of like bass in a small pond. Right. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's just how I think about it. I'd rather see less and see a big one, but you know, that's not what everybody wants. I'd, I'd like to, everybody can say, I don't want to see, I don't care about shooting a big one. Oh, if a big one and a small one walked in, you'd shoot the big one. Come on. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. You know, that, that goes back to the, the baiting, the baiting conversation from earlier. Uh, you know, where you're going to, you're going to live by these morals that you're not going to hunt over bait. But if I showed you this deer and said, all right, but you got to go set in my blind over a corn feeder. You're, you really going to, you really going to take that stance. You're really not going to hunt over bait anymore. Yeah. <laughs> well, you, you see people that a lot of the comments that we get of, and I understand it. Like I've drove all across this country hunting deer and seeing deer in different environments. If you're from a state that you don't understand how other people hunt, like you just don't get it. That's your world. It's your perspective. You can, you can't fathom hunting over bait or hunting with a dog or doing a deer drive, depending on where you're from. So I, I have empathy from that perspective. But what people don't understand in Oklahoma and this uh, broad part of the South that baits, if you do not bait, you are behind. You're, it's a necessary evil. And I don't want to. Like, I'd love to hunt in between these two bedding areas, one on my neighbor, one on me, and hunt a transition in between them. But if you, if I was to turn my feeder off and I'd hear one 300 yards away go off in the morning. And, and what would you do, going? though? What would you do though? You'd be hunting that fence line trying to get him walking to the feeder. At least that's right. what I'd be doing. Because I did that right. on public. Yeah, because I did that <laughs> on public. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah there you go. Hey, hey, exactly. Like I said, you're still still using that resource. And it's like uh back up north, man, you're hunting over, you know, you're hunting over beans and you're hunting over corn. Yeah, you didn't go out there and put it well. I mean, it was planted. Um but, you know, you, you can't, in the Illinois, uh, you can't bait, but you can hunt over corn and you can hunt over beans. And like you said, so, I mean, a little bit of scouting, you figure out where those deer are coming out at and you're still hunting over food. I mean, whether you want to call it natural or not, you can't, can, but I'll tell you a funny story about Illinois. And I, I, I mean, I hope I don't get anybody in trouble up there, but they have a, a store there. They have all the same attractions in that that we have in our school here in Oklahoma. I mean, the crush, the all that stuff sitting on the shelf, but it's illegal to bait in Illinois. So, I mean, I, I don't know what you're feeding that to. If you're feeding that to your, if you're feeding that to your cows, or what you're feeding that to, <laughs> they have all the same stuff in the store. Yeah, all the same stuff in the stores, and half of it's gone. So, I mean, it it is. It is it is what it is, I guess. Well, that's the same thing. I've heard that in Pennsylvania. It's like you can't bait, but they sell deer corn at all the stores. It's like, for what? <laughs> for, yeah. uh, well, just the people right. that are traveling through going to Ohio. It's like, come on, dude. People are baiting. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I, and it, I get the areas just that... Government. My, oh, yeah. Yeah. I understand the people that might be from like CD or CWD areas or maybe, you know, those high disease prone areas where it's like baiting is a is kind of like a hub to to spread all that. But I mean, if again, kind of like Christian said, like if that's not really your 
if that's not really your habitat with that you have to deal with, then, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of irrelevant to talk on other people's. Uh, and, and, you know, people in probably out West, you know, those people, they have, they can't fathom, you know, like what we do, you know, we just sit in a tree stand all afternoon and, and hunt over a pile or hunt over a little food plot, you know, and like I said, different parts of the country, out west oh did i lose you oh you're here no i heard what you're talking about out west oh, okay i'm sorry I, yeah i went out to uh, uh we were just north oh can you hear me hold on yeah can you uh can you uh back out and then rejoin that might help reset the connection well heck freaking biden's america <laughs> <laughs> it's the government they knew we we're talking crap you there yes sir sorry nice. dude, living, living in biden's america they're trying to shut us off man i don't know what we said <laughs> we said we said colorado too many times i guess man they, they, they shut said us, oh, shut us down. triggered yeah what were yeah, you saying about, Jesus. about Colorado? Uh, now we went out there elk hunting. Uh, me and some buddies went backpack, just hunting on our backs out west. And uh, we were down in Chama and New Mexico. And we were just in this restaurant talking to some guys from, from other hunters from there. And yeah, we were talking about it at the house, how we hunt. And man, they, they were just blown away. They're like, man, y- y'all see that many animals? Y'all see that many deer? We're like, oh, yeah, it ain't nothing. See, you know, 20 deer a day. Yeah, yeah, they just they couldn't believe that. They also couldn't believe, you know, that we're we're sitting there hunting over a feeder. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. hilarious. You see that uh picture floating around Facebook that, you know, has different body types, right? Like, you know, the West hunters have like eight pack, and then you know, you have the white tail guys usually have a big old beer gut, and then I mean, that's very true. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, that was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life is elk hunt. Yeah. And I got I thought I was in decent shape when I left the house. I was proved wrong within about three hours. <laughs> Me and Jake went. It was just taking your bow on a hike. It wasn't even hunting. I wouldn't call it a hunt. Yeah, I was about to say that <laughs> that was a donation to Colorado is what it was. Hey, I donated. I've donated several times, man. I, I feel your pain. I've I have donated a friend of mine who was twice. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. I, I, all right he gets back in we'll wrap her can you hear us yes sir you got me all right yeah cool all right so man we uh we appreciate you doing this it's really fun we love talking to people about big deer especially abnormally big deer that we'll never probably ever shoot but it's cool to have buddies (laughs) to do so um for for people that want to keep up with you and uh see you know your future hunting journeys, what you're, what you're going after and you kind of restart in your hunting career per se, where's the best place for them to keep up with you? Ethan Kyle one, pretty simple.